Well, thank you so much. I'm thrilled to be here with this incredible panel of writers. And um, I don't know how many of you here were, yet, were here yesterday, but there uh, was a panel on sort of the future of everything. And one of the panelists was Astro Teller, who has created Google Glass. And one of the things, he, had, he was asked a question of what was his greatest challenge. And it wasn't creating a cell phone that could fit in your contact lens, because I think he feels like that's relatively easy. It was dealing with the other people that he worked with and making sure they felt fulfilled and, um, and rewarded. And it was dealing with all this interpersonal stuff that happened at work. And I thought it was so fascinating um, that that was his greatest challenge. And until we are artificially intelligent out of dealing with each other as people, we're going to be exploring the interactions that people have. And one of the things that the people up here with me do so well is create characters and stories that really help us understand um, those very human interactions. And so I couldn't be more pleased to have the writers of some of the greatest television on today and maybe ever um, up here with me. And I want to introduce Michelle and Robert King, um, who are the creators of The Good Wife, which is in its sixth season. And, uh, is again one of the greatest shows on television and they're going to talk about um, what it's like to be married and not want to kill each other from working together <laughs> every day. Um, there's Genji Cohen who's the creator of Orange is the New Black, previously uh, creator of Weeds um, and also worked on the Tracy Ullman show and the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air where she earned a nickname. Remind me what it was? Oh, uh, White Devil Jew Bitch. No, <laughs> but with love. So <laughs> we're not going to call you that here. This is a safe, <laughs> happy, you know me better. happy place. Um, and Matthew Weiner, who is the creator of Mad Men, and which is, he told me last night that just the night before last, he finished editing the show. Is that right? I finished editing the finale. Yeah. The finale. So I have a lot of free time. Feels, this, is gonna go, this is gonna go on a very feels long time. Pretty, pretty monumental. Um, and you were a writer on The Sopranos before that. Yes. Uh, so it's, an, it's, a great, it's a great group that we have. And what's interesting is we have network, cable, and this new breed streaming, of streaming something media. streaming with Netflix. So, so talk to me about the origin of the show and then also how you keep it kind of newsy and relevant. You had an NSA storyline. You had. You know, you're always throwing the news into it. Well, I mean, in terms of origin, the Spitzer scandal happened, but there were a whole bunch of scandals. We're spoiled uh, for choice. Yeah, a bit. And I mean, what we noticed was that a lot of these women that were staying by their husband were very intelligent, accomplished women, and quite a number of them were attorneys. And so you just had to wonder, OK, what is it that's keeping her by his side? And what is going through her mind? So, I mean, that was a springboard for us. And then you all, you, and you have, you draw in news events. You sort of, it's not ripped from the headlines, but there are elements of it. Um, uh, we, we don't have many advantages over cable. One of the advantages we do have, at least at the moment, is we are writing two months ahead of when it's shown. Mm -hmm. So whatever you can see in the news, you can, can kind of anticipate where it's going and then write that. And then it just, when you're watching it, hopefully live, you will realize it's kind of, kind of echoing what you're reading in the news that day. And the show, Michelle and I always wanted to be, I have a very large family when we go visit them, everybody loves arguing about what's in the current events, whether religion or Israel, Palestine, you know, those are the things people are arguing about. And when you watch TV, you don't see much of that. I mean, people, mm -hmm keep their conversation very clean and kind of timeless, when in fact that's the opposite of how we experience life. So we have a writer's room of seven writers. That's all they do all day is obsess on the news. <coughs> we do a lot of Silicon Valley stuff because that's obviously, if you're awake in these days, that's what's impacting every part of life. We just love kind of digging out these little small things that we hope will blossom into big things. Genji, you have you don't have a rip from the headlines, but you had source material that you started with, but right. only based the show very loosely on that. Talk about why you departed from that so much. Uh, we we quickly abandoned the source material. Um, and the source material is a book. Is a book called Orange, Orange is the New right. Black, written by Piper Kerman, 
uh, partially because there wasn't a whole lot of conflict in the book, uh, but also because very early on in the process we got a call from legal saying we didn't have rights to any of these stories. Oh. And, uh, <laughs> That's a good choice uh, You then. take it from there. Um, and, and also in terms of Piper herself, it, it, it would have gotten a little oppressive both for her and for us to sort of reflect her life back at her week after week. So pretty much after the first episode, we went off and, and so there's nothing made it up. That, that when we're watching the show that is really in, from the book anymore. There are inspirations from the book, but no, we 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 we're we're making it up. Obviously, you're not Matthew. You're not pulling stuff from the headlines, but you no. are talking to people who were working at the time. Mad Men obviously takes place. In yeah, this. I I actually have not. I I have heard all of the stories about what happened at the time after the show went on. I was not involved with anyone beforehand. I worked in network TV, which I felt was a great model for the, the battle of, of uh, art and commerce, and uh, understood what an account man did because I worked with them, and understood the sort of tolerance for the, for the undisciplined nature of trying to get creative people to do something on a deadline. So mm -hmm. I knew that dynamic. And in terms of the period, I read a lot of books, I watched some movies, and I really just kind of got lucky. I mean, I have always had which I think most writers, this is not, this is gonna sound supernatural, but I've met a lot of writers who have it, so maybe, maybe it is supernatural, but maybe writers have it, but um, when everything sort of gets branded at content, as content in a conversation, yeah. you know, the conversations that have been going on here, there is a mystical, magical quality to getting a sense of what happened, to hear that Steve Jobs walked on this stage. I'm pretty sure that, spent, that any one of us spending a half an hour alone in this theater would be able to conjure up some sensation of what that was like. So there were, so you... So I didn't have any source material. <laughs> well, you didn't have any source material, but you talked a little bit, we were talking yeah. earlier about some of the stories... People tell me you, stuff now. People tell you stuff oh, yeah. now about what, what had happened then. So for we talked about the, the, the Joan incident, the sort of oh, bargain yeah. well, that Joan Oh yeah, well one of the recurring things that came up once the show was on the air, people would always sort of tell me the same stories in some form. I don't want to demean the people that come up to me, because a lot of times, you find yourself, uh, and I think everybody has this, a repository for people's pain. And that's kind of your job, but it, sometimes it's really horrible stuff where you're just like, wow, I wish I was not the second person who ever heard that. <laughs> and you should probably tell your mom that you did that. But, um, or but, not. Or not. Yeah. Um, well, I guess she knows, because she's dead. <laughs> but um, no, so, but they would come up and tell me, one of the most frequently told stories was, uh, everybody had a story about somebody pissing in their pants in the office, and uh, everybody had a story uh, of some form, and by the way, this is not all period. This is a workplace show, and a lot of the workplace situations are stuff that exists right now. But in fact, most of it is... people having their period in their office. No, no one ever told me that. A lot of stuff about women crying in the ladies' room. They all love that. They thought that was great. That was very contemporary. I'd actually experienced that. I have two older sisters, so some of this is informed by that, and a mom who, who went back to school. And then they always told me about Joan. They were always like, oh yeah, there's a girl in our firm who did that. Uh, there was a woman, you gotta have one of those or whatever. And it was always sort of, I don't know if it was as public as Joan's situation was, that people had a meeting and talked about it, but well, and there just definitely- For the audience that we're, we're talking about. Joan, jo yes. Please. Joan, uh, the character of Joan was offered uh, a, uh, to spend a night, was offered a, a, a partnership stake in the firm in order for spending a night with a client. And, the, the, and I heard the story so many times, either it insinuated or whatever, um, and the biggest difference between what we did and what really happened is no one ever got a partnership out of it. <laughs> but you also have to make sure you hear the story after, otherwise they'll come after you and see you. Yeah, I, I, and the I, problem is so many of these stories are universal and everyone thinks it's, oh my God, that was my story, they took it. So you have to, live in a bubble sometimes when you're creating this because it's very dangerous. People identify with this stuff I had, very much. Yeah, I had a great experience, which is that the head of the agency that I was at, um, I turned in the pilot. There wasn't a great deal of interest in it. A AMC was basically like getting your show. So I come from The Sopranos and basically taken this spec script that had been around and had, I had, uh, uh, it had been around for at that point four and a half years. And uh, there was absolutely no interest in AMC or them doing anything and everybody thought I was flushing it down the toilet. I can't even say what's comparable now, but Basic Cable, original program Basic Cable was sort of like 
like being the first person on YouTube. They're like, they're not going to find it. Well, this they're not going to. I mean, I, yeah. I remember when AMC, yeah. when it was going to AMC, and you thought, oh, well, that there's people were like, no one's going to see it. I'm like, nobody else wanted to make it, and they had promised me creative control, and I was totally willing to take less money to get to tell the story that nobody wanted to tell. Yeah. So we were talking. Um, the name of this panel has changed a variety of a number of times. It was the golden age of television. Now it's the golden age of drama or the 21st century television. Um, when we were talking about, one, do you think we are in a golden age of television, Robert? And the, and the difference between tele, television and movies, I mean, anyone can answer this, but yeah. making those. Oh, it's an incredible golden age. I mean, look, we start as fans. We watch everything. Um, and there's just so much to watch. I mean, even what's coming up is the affair, which is but transparent. I mean, it's just, you, I, we, Unfortunately, because when I started with wanting to write movies and wrote some, it's, there's nothing really that interesting in development in movies unless it's a, foreign brought, a movie brought over foreign or something that's made on a nothing budget. We, they pay us to write 22 movies a year, little movies. And right. we have Final Cut because there's no time to question it. What's you, startling to me is we've had a, a number of feature writers ask us recently could we please sit down with you and talk about how we might get into television? What is surprising to me, one of them is a multi Academy Award winner. You the can other, tell us who. If no, you want. I will not. <laughs> and the other one has written three of the top 10 gross films ever. They're Why so is that? Slow. What? Uh, they are slow. They're so, I, so slow. I have, I have Robert Town and Frank Pearson on my staff, so. But I actually. Um, if I uh, just to say this, I think that the the first of all, the immediacy is something that's been a surprise to everybody. We know that that we could write something and it's on the air. Yes. No one can beat that, and it's produced, and everything you write gets shot. And whatever process there is, sometimes, you know, we did this episode about uh, about the the defenders, which was in 1962, that they wanted to, had to do this abortion. They wanted to do this abortion story, and the way they got it through is that there were no scripts to shoot. They literally kept sending there was terrible in scripts, the no, deliberately, sending oh. Wolfman scripts, and they're like, we can't shoot this. And like, well, we got that abortion one, and they're like, fine, shoot it. And I mean, it, the, the pipeline has to be fed. Writers are so subversive. But um, <laughs> the guy in the show, when we did the recreation, there was a quote of a guy who apparently had actually said this. When, when they finally had to shoot it, he goes, I missed the blacklist. Which <laughs> 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 is horrible. But um, I think that um, we see people attracted to it. It has been an expansion. Of, uh, it's been a creative opportunity, an opportunity for voice, an opportunity for writers in particular. Right, but writer, I think it, I think the golden king. age well, thing is, a, is a marketing ploy. I think it's a I think it's an exaggeration. Oh, I completely disagree. I, I do. Okay. Good. Okay. Good. Now to something like 20 years ago. Like what? There is so much. Are you talking about how much there is to see? Yeah, I think no, Hill Street Blues ago, was Hill 20 years ago. Yeah. And, yeah. I, you know, there's always been a lot of crappy TV, Molly and there's died. still a lot of crappy TV, and there's some good TV. But and there's, there's so a, I mean, much more of it that the well, that doesn't more make it good. good. Is this what it's like in the writers' room? <laughs> yes. Because <laughs> that was going to be my next question. Um, yes. what and that's actually on? when you know when you have something good when folks are fighting. Well, that's so. Okay, so f when people are fighting, that's yeah. a good sign. We have Gen three G lawyers in our room that are constantly oh, going yeah. at it. And as soon as they go out and they have little minute, and we're just kind of sitting back, okay, we don't understand a word you're saying, but it's a good area if it can bring out that much disagreement. And that's kind of what's fun about a writer's room. And Genji, you said at one point that there's a cycle, can be a cycle of abuse in a writer's room. And there I'm just can wondering. Be. <laughs> yeah. <I never. laughs> there can be. But there's, uh, you, you can't allow it to continue because then it's an unsafe place and you need a safe place for all this stuff to come out. So you can fight about the work, um, but once, but if you have someone in there who makes it unsafe for the other writers, they gotta go. It's not okay. Their are per, their personalities. Their I mean, you can end up with someone toxic. who's super talented and right. they're like a, a borderline personality and they will split the room apart it's and, and okay. then people have, they, they, their writers are kind of, you know, you're, you're paying them for their emotional instability sometimes. Right. And you're and and you'll get someone who like is transferring their parental relationship onto the room and and then you you know and we're just trying to get the show done. I mean, right, there's really so much more all than I remember that. was like being on both sides of it. Well, I was gonna say you've all have been in yeah. the writers' room, and, like you're and you've... giving my boss an outline, and 
you know, it's got to be, David Chase, got to be in on Monday. And I was like, you know, I said to Terry Winter, I'm like, it's, I, I don't think I'm going to have it until Tuesday or something like that. Can I ask him? And he goes, he's going to say, you've heard it in the show, where's my fucking money? <laughs> I was like, okay, I'll give, I'll give the, the, the thing in. And then I spent the next 10 days in the writer's room and walking past him in the hallway and just thinking like he hated it, has he read it yet, has he hated it, he, blah, blah, blah. And then, and then he finally gets, afterwards he goes, I read the outline, it's very good, I'm gonna get some notes for you. And, and once I had the job and realized that to him, that probably felt like an hour, Right. Because you're doing 50 right. you jobs, and to me, on. every day I was like, "Oh, now he's mad at me." He he's must not have just read it. focused directly on yeah. you the whole time. Your power, so your yeah. But the room that. is a crazy thing. You spend so much time together, and you're making this thing together, and all your personal shit comes out. And one of our writers was <laughs> recently in um, therapy with her wife, and and she brought this thing back to the room. It's really annoying, but it's actually been interesting in the room. They were taught that they're they're fighters, and they were told that. In the middle of the fight, they have to check in and say, what's your level of caring on this issue? <laughs> so they'll be, because they both like instinctively just fight. So they'll have to take a pause and say, okay, do you really care that I didn't walk the dog? It's like, my level of caring is a three. Uh, well, my level of caring is a five. Okay, you win, or whatever it is. So they've, we've sort of, they, so this writer has started incorporating in this room and they'll be fighting about a story point and it's like, well, what's your level of caring? Mine's at eight. It's like, well, mine's a four. Okay, well, then I win this story point. <laughs> It's been fascinating. But can you always win that fight if you're like, my level of caring is a 10? Well, that's the thing. You it's can like, go, you go in and you yet, win. Or my level yeah. of caring is Sometimes executive you don't even, producer. <laughs> well, there's that trump yeah. card. Sometimes you don't what? even know that they my care. My level of caring is executive uh, producer. Right, yeah, right, right. Sometimes right. you come in and it's like going to the, to the you know, it's like the, you're the social worker visiting the room. They, but your <laughs> number two has been running the room and you walk in and you're like, so what do we have? And they start pitching it and the person's pitching it and they go, and he goes into the store. It's not a store. They go to the beach. <laughs> <laughs> and you did. You, uh, I. What did I say? I said there's a store. It's at the. It's at the beach. It's not a big deal. And finally, I'm like, I don't know if I like it. I told you, you didn't say it was. A, and they're all sort of looking at each other. Can we disagree so with it? And you're sort of like. And you're like, I didn't. I don't care if it's a store or a beach. I hate the story. We're not doing it. Like, I mean, right, right. <laughs> well, that's because she pitched it bad. Jen, she you, sabotaged you, it. You said, um, or you told a story once that right. an ex-boyfriend of yours said that you had a better chance of being elected to Congress, to Congress than getting on the staff of a television show. Than getting on the staff yeah. of a television show. Talk oh, about yeah. that. Oh, vengeance is a great motivator. My whole career is like, fuck you, David Gershwin. Or yeah, David know. Schmerzman. Um, Maybe it's worth you know, it, exactly. it's, it's really good to, th that motivates me all the time. When someone says you can't, it's so good for me, which is probably really unhealthy. Um, well, but you've, you've done okay. You've turned I, yeah, it, you've turned you it around. You need to thrive on rejection. Yeah. Um, Otherwise, you'll get, because, yeah, because you're rejected constantly. So if it doesn't feed something in you, then this is the wrong business, probably. One of the great things about the show, this, you know, the panel talks about drama, but it's a kind of a comedy inside a women's prison, which is not normally where you would expect but to I find mean, it. But how do you survive any dark situation? It, you have to have humor or you, you perish. Um, there's too much darkness in the world and, and it, it, it's a coping mechanism. And I can't imagine any situation where, where you don't um, invoke humor to, to get through it. Uh, you said that Piper was your Trojan horse. What did you mean by that? You know, to a certain extent, if you go into a network and say, I want to do a show about poor Latina and black women and their <laughs> issues, it's, it's not a big selling tool. It's, it's not gonna, you know, it doesn't go over and uh, the private Benjamin, girl, white girl and fish out of water conceit is, is familiar and it's, it's, it, it's an easy, it's an easier sell. Um, I was interested in all the stories, but this was a very um, accessible way to get into them. And it was already there in the book. Um, but it was never my intention to just go in and tell Piper's story. It was the gateway to all these stories for me. It, for me, it was always an ensemble. It wasn't a star vehicle. It's a great, it, was a great it was a great structural like, stroke of creativity to me that just as someone who followed the show, just like see like some character that you think is completely insignificant right. is going to take over this episode and of course casting helps. Yeah, yeah. We've all tried to do that and it doesn't hold up sometimes. 
but you have people can hold it up and you just see the story written straight through with that person outside the prison. The whole thing to me, when you told me the idea, I was like, oh my God, how are you gonna get out of there? Is it really going to be there? I mean, uh, is it going to be Oz, you know? Well, the, the, when I, you, not that that's not a great show. It's just right, not, right. not I mean, what, the no, she, it didn't sound as funny as what she was talking there about. There are so many unknowns, obviously, in Orange is the New Black. One of the things that was exciting about it is that it didn't come with this big drum roll of like big, big names that were going to make, put Netflix on the map. And yet it is the most watched show, Netflix original, in all of their regions um, and all their algorithms and there's not a single I mean the, Piper is the star but but she did, wasn't even but she's receded so, I mean so that you care so much you care about crazy eyes and you care about I mean we have transsexuals there's all sorts of interesting people um, on the show that you wouldn't have necessarily expected I want to ask about the Netflix pitch process because I want to explore a little bit we do have you know again cable network and netflix and netflix is the newest and least explored among those tell us what's different about or what was different about uh, pitching for netflix what's awesome about netflix is they not only say yes they say yes and shoot a whole season uh they eliminate the pilot process which is so wasteful um and they it's a real leap of faith and they say we believe in you and they give you room to fulfill your creative vision in, in, in a whole way. You're not limited to everything in the kitchen sink in one hour. Um, and when you go into a room and say, yeah, make, go make 13 hours of that, that's a dream come true. Hmm. Um, because <laughs> well, no. uh, then you have to go make 13 hours. Yeah. And so but, you make them all, so when we were talking about you are writing, Robert Michelle, you're writing shows and reacting in some ways to the audience. You, you write it all at once. You have right, no right. audience feedback to sort no. of draw on. And Matthew, that's the Well, I've had both, you. but um, I, I, the only drama I ever worked on was The Sopranos. And uh, I was a comedy writer for seven or eight years before that and half hour. So what I knew, I just assumed that was the way everybody did it, but I think that especially when you start a new story at the beginning of the season, you always want to stop at like five. You want to get the first five, and you guys must do this too. And I think actually that that, that, that tradition of one hour drama that you guys are part of that too. And um, they, that style from the, and so you got, try and get five, you see what the stories are doing, you see how they're doing, you see if you cast it right, you see if any chemistry develops. You don't want to be locked into something because you're sure that's how it's going to go. And also you sort of run out of it, you're like, that's enough for now, let's just shoot it. We'll break six as soon as we've shot I one see. and then we'll keep going. We still do that in our model. We break up to six. We have a trajectory for the full 13, but we write the first six and send everyone off and kind of break up the room until we see how those are looking before we do the second half. So it's Breaking really is constructing a story. Good. So you can Thank have a story you. arc for the entire season, but then you need stories. So right. uh, you have a season where you say, okay, Don just got divorced. Um, it's gonna start with him going through the holidays and it's going to end with him proposing to his secretary. This, woman, uh, this woman's gonna come in who's an advisor, a consultant. They're gonna have a sort of affair and then he's sort of gonna, so you have all that. But then you have the first story and you're like, okay, so we're starting on Thanksgiving. So what's Don's Thanksgiving about? Well, actually, it's going to be about that Don made this huge ad, and he's super successful, and he, he's alone in the cruddiest department in the world. That, that, that's breaking the story, and then you have to do the story for the different characters. Right. So you're literally talking about, like, 15 stories by the time you get to five episodes, or I don't know how many guys, sometimes an extra one. Do you think about, um, I want to talk specifically about the end of Mad Men, but do you think about the end of the show when you start it, do you think about how you, do you know where it's going, Robert and Michelle? Yeah. yeah. You know. Yeah. Genji, do you know? Uh, I have plan A and plan B. What are they? <laughs> oh, I'll just tell you all about it. <laughs> I, um, I always want to know, and again, I watched this, I came to work at The Sopranos at the beginning of the season, David Chase would have some rumination period. We'd start and he'd come in with this chart that basically had a business story for Tony, and a personal story for Tony, and then a, a, a story for each one of the characters. And I called Genji before I started. I'm like, I have stories for the people. How do I do it? I don't want to do that show where you check in on them every week and they just like have an incremental jump. And she right. goes, someone will have a story. And she said, you just want to do it. Just do it all at once. And David Chase's advice to me was, when you have something good, it's worth taking your time to get there. So I always feel like when I come into the beginning of the season with an image, 
of like what year it is, where we're starting, where it's going to end. And then the writers start ruminating on it, and you start getting all these other things out of it. But I usually have a theme sort of for the season, uh, something related to my life or whatever. Right. And then, but the whole show ending, yeah, that's a totally different thing. Right. I mean, most I, of us don't. I go one season at a time. You go yeah, one season. Yeah, one season. I always leave everything on, uh, on, on the. I don't leave anything on the floor. I do every idea that I've ever had. It by the time the finale of the season comes, there's nothing, there's nothing left. Nothing left. Okay. I want to ask because we had, we've had conversations about technology and YouTube and all, and, and all of these new sort of ways of streaming and watching, what's next? Do you guys think about why don't you put something directly on YouTube or is that something that's an interesting to you? Do, you? do you worry about the future of of your role I, in entertainment? I feel like after my experience on AMC, I've been in the new media. That might as well have been the internet. And I'm very excited about being anywhere. I am particularly concerned, and I, I, I may be the only person to bring this up at the conference, but I think that we are squandering our relationship with intellectual property. And I think that there has to be some control and legislation, basically, that you can reprint any article that you write from Vanity Fair 800 times. You can show our clips on YouTube. You can show them on Google. You can, you could, it, there's just, and this is the golden goose. Despite right. all of these people are making this machinery that's conveying our content, and, uh, and the content is not being treated very respectfully. Right. Does anyone have any questions? Because we don't have that much time left. But if you do have a question, I'll take it. And if you don't, I'll just question. keep asking Last questions. question. <laughs> OK. Go ahead. Hi. I have a question just about how you choose. It seems like today there's a lot of characters that start off you know, like the bumbling kind of likable person like Piper or uh, Walt in Breaking Bad. And then throughout the, the series, they just become like this dislikable kind of person. And one is, is, is this like a new thing? Am I just too young to know that this has been going on for a long time? Or is there something about today that makes that like a, a, a storyline that people are drawn to? And two, like how does it feel personally to write a character and then have them do these like awful things and have the viewer look at them and be like, oh, I don't like them at all. <laughs> um. <laughs> I think everyone is flawed. I never bought the hero or villain model. I think everyone lives in gray areas. Um, I, I think very few people set out to, to be awful, and they rationalize their behavior in a lot of ways. Um, but people do fucked up things and then try to come back from it, and it's very human, and that's what I'm interested in. Um, and sometimes you don't like people, and that's OK. And then they recover, or they screw up again. And I, I find it much more interesting than you know, the white hat or the black hat. It goes in and out of style, too. It is a little bit, in, I mean, my character was never uh, anything but supposed to be like a regular person. He has an extraordinary life, but he's a regular person. And when I hear people talk about likability, not likability, that's what they talk. That's not how they feel. George Costanza is the lowest testing character in the history of television. <laughs> He is the most beloved. He is repulsive. He does awful <laughs> things. He walks out of the bathroom with his underwear around his pants, screaming Vandalay Industries. He's a joy. He's a treasure. He is not likable. Thank you. Um, I, one question for each of you, and then we're, I can't believe we're out of time. But um, what's the most tweeted moment of your shows? Oh, Robert for, Michelle. For, for us, that's easy. Will Gardner uh, died in the last season. When he gets and, shot in the yeah, courtroom. Yeah, he was shot and, in the courtroom. And that was a big surprise, fortunately for us. It was something we were hoping would not get out, and it didn't. And that was a big uptick in social media for us. Benji, do you know? I'm not on Twitter. You're not on Twitter. She's not on Twitter. Oh my god. Great. Good for you. Me either. Um, no, you're not either. I would need to. I need one to apologize for the other one. I, I, <laughs> I, I just got a smartphone. I, I'm phone. I'm so. I mean, I love it, but I'm so impulsive and like, I, I it's just a bad would idea. Would be out of control. No, it just really is. And, and by the way, nothing funny translates. I, I was watching the comedy people this morning. I was like, the real skill, and it sort of came up yesterday, is having an electronic personality is just like having a good phone voice. And whatever it is, whenever I say something that even has a hint of sarcasm in it, which is the lowest form of humor I know, Not but it's, it's, it, what? My jokes are? Fart jokes are? No. But always funny. How about a sarcastic always fart funny. joke? 
<laughs> so, but I, um, I, I it, it, my, it does not translate. I've written things where, I mean, to people, I was just talking about this morning, where I'm writing something like, hey, I, I, I'm not even going to say it. All I can tell you is that I have been misunderstood a lot and I don't want to tweet. Not and in terms of the audience's interaction, we all are so excited to have an audience. But to keep track of that thing, that'll drive you. You cannot have the audience's voice in your head or you are, will be paralyzed. That's the network's problem. Well, we will have to leave it there. Thank you all so much. Thank I you. really appreciate your.